Well, you wrote a couple interesting articles here, as you always do. And I, I thought central banks were entering a, a, an arena of monetary tightening. And one of your latest articles, you talked about how central banks are massively, to a large degree, purchasing assets. And uh, the last ditch effort to save economy and cap gold price. We're talking about in the last five months here, central banks purchasing 1.5 trillion in assets. Steve, let's go over some of this data that you've compiled for us. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting observation that we hear the Fed they're going to start selling some of their assets on their balance sheet. They're going to they say normalize. There's no such thing as normal anymore. Normal was like a decade and a half, two decades ago. We're, we're no longer normal. Nothing is normal. Everything is is manipulated, rigged, or propped up. So it seems normal, but it's not. It's abnormal. But uh, if we look at what the central banks have been buying from 2011 to 2000, the end of 2016, they purchased $7 trillion worth of assets. And those are bonds, you know, mortgage-backed securities, as, as well as now stocks. So uh, that's about like $1.4 uh, trillion uh, of assets a year. Well, like you mentioned, they purchased $1.5 trillion in the first five months of 2017. Mm -hmm. So they purchased more than they did in every year before already. And we're only not even halfway through. So that means why are they doing that? What's the reason to per be purchasing that much more assets? Well, it means like a drug. You know, when you do a drug, when you're addicted to a drug, you, the same amount isn't going to help you you start going into withdrawals if you don't have uh, enough drug or so you've got to start taking even more and so this is what we're at now and uh, so when the fed says they're going to start selling assets if they do uh, they're not really selling them because they're, they're it's being propped up they're they're buying them themselves so they this is just a sign to show you how unbelievably crazy and insane the central bank's uh, asset purchase have become now if we go, if we look at the total asset purchases of the four, of the six banks, and it's a Swiss National Bank, you got the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the, uh, the People's Bank of China, the ECB, and the Fed. Well, before we had the stock market crash and the economic crash in 2008 9, they held about $5 trillion in assets. That's it, five. It's it's over eighteen trillion now, and it, it is it almost encompasses forty percent of those countries' GDP. So we're just seeing how how much this is being used to uh, prop up the market. And what is interesting, Deutsche Bank. Now, we, can we believe what Deutsche Bank says? Well, some of it we can because uh, they make a pretty good uh, point here that. Some of the analysts at Deutsche Bank warn that if the central banks are the risk assets, they call it a red line. If the if the central banks are purchasing more than two hundred billion, that's where they put the risk asset uh, red line. That's what they as they call it at two hundred billion. Well, they've been doing three hundred billion for the last five months. So, what does that mean? That means things are going into very insane you know territory. And let me conclude by saying this: uh, How much is a 300 billion of asset purchases a month? How much does that equal? Well, the world produces about 10.7 billion ounce, uh, 10.7 billion dollars worth of gold a month. So the central banks, which have gold on their balance sheet, still, they they are buying. 28 times the amount of global gold production. And it, it's even worse than that, Kenneth. If we look at the last five months, what the central banks have purchased, and it's mostly the ECB and Japan, the 1.5 trillion, that's half of all the gold investment in the world. All of it. Central bank holdings, pu uh, public and private holdings, all the gold that you can get your hand on that's either coin or bar, uh, it's about $3 trillion. That's what That's what the number is. 
you know, if you could get your hands on all of it. So in just the last five months, central banks have purchased the same amount of money in assets as half the gold in the world, uh, investment gold. So again, we're just seeing more evidence when you look at the numbers, how insane everything is getting, Kenneth. That, that is insane. And uh, you bring up the three trillion that could be available. I mean, only seven trillion has been uh, historically ever uh, mined, roughly, and uh, that's what is crazy when you when you think about how small this market is and how the fiat monetary system is just fighting against the gold price, and the gold is not reflecting all this money printing as of yet. As of yet, and I, I, you, one thing before we move on here, you bring up the fact that it's the ECB and, and, and Japan that is pretty much buying up, or you know, the the staggering 1.5 trillion in assets that have been purchased over the last year that have uh, been primarily done by the ECB in Japan. So my question is, is what does that say about the U.S.? Is the U.S. actually tightening or do you believe that they're part of what's going on with this asset purchase program and are they fighting the, the global trend or are they getting away with a, a, an improving U.S. market? Well, you know, we have to remember this is what we know publicly. This is publicly what we all, this is what we're told publicly. Uh, so when we've realized that, you know, it's like an iceberg. When you see the big iceberg floating out there in the, in the Arctic Ocean, you know, you're seeing like maybe a fifth of it or a quarter of it. Most of it is underground, under, underwater. It's the same thing that's going on with the central banks. Uh, I'd imagine the Fed is still buying assets, secret, secretively. Uh, I mean, we know that we've heard several uh, instances of tens of trillions of dollars, tens of trillions of dollars of currency swaps since 2008. Now, there, there really isn't any way we can put uh, uh, hard figures on these with concrete figures. So, but if we. If the ECB in Japan is purchasing that many assets, the, uh, the U.S. Fed has to be doing something too secretively. So um, while they may not, we, while they may not be showing it publicly, they're not buying mortgage-backed securities or they're not buying other assets publicly. I would imagine they're they are buying stocks. I, I would imagine they're doing that, just like the Swiss National Bank is doing, just like. Japan is doing and just like China is doing so um, now whether what they do what they say going forward like they just raised rates I mean it's insane that they're raising rates uh, and some uh, analysts are saying that they're doing that to you know further destroy the Trump presidency I, I, I don't know you can make any speculation but the thing is why would they be rising interest rates in a softening weakening economy uh, and, and so, uh, and also the thing is you need low interest rates to allow this system to function because as we mentioned, I've mentioned before in, in pr prior uh, interviews with you, when you have so much debt in the system, you, you can't service it. It's, it's just, it becomes, it's like, uh, it, it, if you have a, uh, $100,000 debt and it, you're paying a 2% interest, well, you're paying a $2,000 interest payment. Well, what happens if it goes to a million? Then you're paying twenty thousand. Hmm. So the problem is, if the interest rate goes from one percent to three percent, then you're now you're paying you're paying you're, you're paying a lot more money. And so the interest rates can't really rise, but they're they're pushing them up. I think more towards it's a political agenda. So, in retrospect, Kenneth, I think behind the scenes, the central banks are doing a lot more than we realize. Wow. Yeah, in, in the face of really this extended bull market, this recovery that we've been in now since the OA crisis, supposedly. And we, we don't really have room to combat it other than them doing what they say they're, they're, they're not doing or uh, other than them lowering interest rates, possibly going negative. 
uh, it, it's really interesting, interesting point we're at. Bill Gross, I know, has said that the market risk is highest since before the 2008 crisis. And really, the Fed has been unable to easily hike rates as fast as they've been hoping for. And analysts are calling what we have here a bubble in stocks, real estate, and bonds this time around. And unlike 2008 and uh, 2000, where there was just one and, and two legs of that equation, now we have all three coming together. So uh, let's talk about that a little bit here. You know, in the last 100 years, 16 out of the 19 rate cycles that we've had have been followed by recessions. And I'm just wondering why central bank policymakers think this will be any different. I, I think it's out of the hands of the central bank. I really do, and uh, unfortunately, it's kind of like a, it's an autopilot. Uh, I think the amount of intervention now, and we, we just spoke about the $1.5 trillion, uh, the amount of intervention that we know about, and as well as the, what, what, we, what we don't know about, is, is, is propping up the system. And we, uh, we mentioned this in the pre-interview, how uh, the U.S., you know, you know you're getting in bubble territory when the median price of a home is 10 times or more the median income of the home. Well, in China, it's 20 to 30 times. So China is a, is, is a bigger bubble than the United States. Um, but in the United States, is in a huge bubble. Now, I, I just published a new guest post. And there's a guy that writes a, it's a uh, website called Ponzi World Blogspot. And I, I pay attention to some of his articles. He, he's got a very colorful way. <laughs> he uses a lot of four-letter words. But anyhow, he's got some great charts. And one of his charts, it's, it's, it's just eye-opening. It shows the S&P 500 and the S&P Volatility Index, which is a 20-day moving average. And you can clearly see as the index goes up, the S&P 500 goes up, the volatility index goes down. Well, the, he's got a blue line. If you check out my newest article, and it's called Collapse of the New Economics, he's got a little blue line at the bottom of the chart, and it shows you in 2007, when the index was at its peak, the volatility was at its lowest. Lowest, actually, since 1998. Guess what? You go across now to 2017 today, we're below it. We finally went below that. Mm. But get this, the S&P 500 is up almost double of what it was in 2007. So the, the volatility index has, has, has collapsed, which gives, this, gives the indication that things are fine. There's not a lot of volatility going on, but it's the calm before the storm. And also in the article, he, he compares the S&P 500 to what is known as the brick-and-mortar retail industry, which is, you know, the, the shopping malls, the stores, the retail outlets. And he's got uh, one of Bed Bath & Beyond. He's got one showing the Whole Foods and the Gap stores. And he compares them all with the S&P 500. Well, the S&P 500 continues towards the moon where all the, the retail stores are collapsing. And it's, it's, it's not because, he says it's not because of Amazon. You cannot blame the entire collapse of the retail market, the automobile industry, um, the, the, the commercial, the commercial uh, market, REIT market. You can't blame it on Amazon. So what this suggests is the central banks are going to be uh, incapable of dealing with when this thing really starts to get out of their hand. And so well, what we're looking at now is that we're looking at a system, as you mentioned, and I'll conclude by saying this. In 2007, we had the housing market in, in, in big trouble, and we had the automobile industry. Now we have the energy sector, and we can talk about that in a minute. The energy sector is in really bad trouble. Back then, they were, they were making money. Now they're not making they're not, they haven't been making really any money for the last six to eight years. And then we have the bond market, which is a big bubble. And so 
when you put all those together, it's like the perfect storm. And again, you know, Kenneth, if they can continue manipulating this for a while, uh, we don't know the timing of this crash or this collapse. But when it does happen, it, it's going. It's really going to take people by surprise. It's kind of like what's happened in the cryptocurrency market. I mean, it was relatively unknown. Yeah, some people have been following it, but. Look what's happened to the cryptocurrency market. Out of the blue, within about two, three weeks, they have become just insane, their levels. Whether you agree with them or not, I see that happening to the the precious metals markets and and the mining shares. I see the same thing happening in time. So that, that is what we're looking forward to in the future. Well, and I really, and this is something Andy Hoffman has talked about, it's really interesting what's going on with cryptocurrencies because it's another leg to what the central banks have to fight against. It's this competition uh, to their fiat currency system. I think most people, if you kind of sep- your, separate yourself from uh, your conflicts of interests, and I'm talking about the, the central bankers, you would agree that a fiat currency system, one that you can just print money out of thin air, is probably not good for savers. And here we are with cryptocurrencies, which many are limited, and and Bitcoin specifically, 21 million. And, you know, the, the central bankers, maybe they would say, hey, you know, that's probably a better idea for some sort of currency or uh, gold. But of course, they don't like these because it's competition to, to what they have going for them. And uh, I, I just wonder how much they can continue to hold everything together before the, the water just bursts out of this bubble or <laughs> it's a, the dam that seems to just be I- imploding. So, um, Steve, yeah, let's talk about gold here for a little while longer. I don't know if you want to touch any more on cryptocurrencies. What are your general thoughts on those? But, I mean, let's talk about gold here. What what do we have on the horizon for for gold here going forward in 2017? Yeah, before I do, let me say this about cryptocurrencies. Um, I, if I knew now... If I knew then, let's say three three years ago, four years ago, what I know now about cryptocurrencies, I would have I would have likely purchased some. And it's not it's not because of they've taken off, you know, fifteen hundred percent some of them in the last uh, several months. I didn't realize the amount of energy it took to produce a Bitcoin and the capital. It's 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 unbelievable. And I've been working, talking with, and emailing with some of these uh, techie guys who are who understand. It, it, it takes a lot of capital, as in the miners. It's actually a, a a machine that makes the Bitcoin electronically, digitally, in the cryptocurrency, and then it takes a whole bunch of energy, electricity, to produce one Bitcoin. And people have no idea how much money it costs. And I'm actually putting together a um, I'm in the beginning stages of a new paper report and that's part of it to show actually what it costs to produce a Bitcoin and that this was actually as about a month ago uh, and so the thing about the cryptocurrencies and I'm not saying I'm against or for them I do think they're going to be in trouble with the problem with you need you need a highly functioning uh, technological system to allow the cryptocurrencies to function. Well, if you have a collapse of the system and energy is a big problem, well, that thing doesn't function function that well. Gold and silver continue to because they have been doing that for 2,000 years. But the, the thing that people need to realize, I hear that, that cryptocurrencies are a Ponzi scheme. Well, they're not backed by debt. Like you mentioned, the fiat currencies can be printed. Yes, they can be. But there's still all this massive debt behind all the all the fiat currencies. There's no debt behind cryptocurrency, mm-hmm. even though some of them may not be uh, their their values are much higher than let's say their net their worth. Uh, um, and it's really hard to gauge what their worth is. But at least there's no debt behind them. 
There's no big giant debt that's owed. So I think there's a lot to be learned in the future about cryptocurrencies. I think the valuations are going to get really insane going forward. Now, moving. Let me gold, let me jump in right there before we switch topics. One of the things that's interesting, and you brought up, and I, I think it's worth exploring, is you mentioned if how much energy something takes or, or a Bitcoin takes to actually mine. Uh, but that doesn't necessarily mean something has value. Just because you spent a lot of money or spent a lot of energy on something doesn't make it worth anything. You could spend a whole lot of time and energy in, in a failed project that is worth zero. Wouldn't you agree with that? Yeah, in, in, in classic economics, which I've become, I, I've, de I've deviated away from, I, I don't believe that classic economics prices are based upon supply and demand. Um, supply and demand do are factors in the short-term price movements of goods and services, commodities, and energy, and the metals. They are. But the overriding... The, when we average everything, you see, we can't talk about oh, what's the what is the value of a glass of water to a to a to a thirsty uh, person in the in the desert. That's not the average. Mm. It, the average is what the market is buying and selling as a whole. And do we know that the the uh, the value of most goods and services is based upon the cost of production? Because if you look at the automobile industry, you look at the housing market, you look at the retail uh, clothing market, you look at the fast food industry, they all have margins. These margins aren't 50%. They're not 100%. The grocery store margins, supermarkets are like 1% to 2%. Mm. You go below that, they're not making money. And the, the supermarkets are not selling goods or services at 50% above margin. They're not uh, above cost. Some some industries are making more are, are making higher margins. But if we average the entire market, the margins are the profit based upon the cost of production all the way down the line. So when we look at goods and services in an economy, on average, there's a very little margin above the profitability of the cost of production. So it is true that some things, like Tesla, <laughs> it is for an example, they're not making any money. You know why? Because solar and electric vehicles will never take off. They just won't. It's a neat idea, but it takes a lot of coal, natural gas, and oil to produce them. And when coal, natural gas, and oil becomes problematic, and it is, it's becoming too expensive, then you can't produce electric vehicles and solar. It's not, it's, it's not commercially viable. So, yes, some things you can spend a lot of money and they're not worth it. I agree. But uh, I was just trying to give, a, some people have no idea what it costs to produce Bitcoin. They think, well, it's now trading at 2500 Well, that means it may cost ten dollars to produce a bitcoin it's not ten dollars it's not a hundred dollars it's much higher so at least when you, it's called proof of work when it's the the, the uh, let's say the technology the cryptocurrency the algorithms to produce a bitcoin cost energy cost capital just like a car just like an ounce of gold just like an ounce of silver or service or even copper and all these markets charge a small margin a profit and so the market actually self reinforces or self itself uh, regulates itself uh, on, on on its margin through competition and and so you, you won't you won't find one company selling something at 50% margin it's very rare now so the market is self regulating itself so I just wanted to say that at least understanding what it costs to produce Bitcoin, the notion that a price based that is totally just esoteric, at least we have an understanding that it costs a certain amount to produce Bitcoin. It's mm -hmm. just not a digital currency produced out of thin air, like a dollar. Because you know what it costs to produce a dollar, a $100 bill? It costs 14 cents. 
That's called probably because there's somebody's inflated. Oh. Someone probably has an inflated salary. That's overseeing that project. <laughs> yeah, so uh, a Bitcoin costs a heck of a lot more to produce than a $100 bill. Sure, and then, of course, people are seeing the utility of it. And the value, like you said, someone's starving or is extremely thirsty out in the middle of the desert. There are a lot of people starving for ways to get their money out of the current system. Look at Argentina, look at Venezuela, look at some of these countries in Europe where there's all these capital controls. And uh, this is a, an opportunity to instantly transfer money from border to border by turning on your computer in another country. And really, I mean, the paradigm shift that is happening in cryptocurrencies is just amazing. And really, us as Americans, we, we don't fully understand that the same way that some of these people around the world are expect, uh, experiencing cryptocurrencies. So uh, let's not spend too much more time on that. The time is getting away from us. I want to talk about gold and then I want to talk about energy. So uh, let's talk about gold here, Steve. We've talked about the, the massive money printing that has been going on, yet we're not seeing gold being revalued to reflect all, all this money printing. I mean, there's statistics out to this, hey, gold should be $10,000, $20,000, or, or, or even higher to reflect all the money printing we've seen, but yet we're looking at a $1,250 uh, gold pricing and we get excited when it moves $10. Let's talk about this for a little bit. Well, after the 2008 market crash, we, we started on the, the central bank started propping everything up. And from 2009, to 2011, the QE, money printing, all went into everything, went into everything. Oil, went into stocks, bonds, real estate, gold and silver. Gold and silver, you know, silver reached a high of almost 50 in May 2011. Gold reached a high of uh, 1900 in September. Now, what's interesting, they announced QE3 at the end of September 12. Well, uh, that year, it was interesting, even though gold hit a high in 2011, its average high was even higher in 2012. It was like almost $1,670. It was higher than it was in 2011, the average price of the year. And silver was a little bit lower. It was like $30 compared to 35 in 2011. So here are the, the precious metal investors. Oh, God, they're going to now, they're going to do QE3. And now we're all, we're all kind of like wringing our hands and salivating. Here we go. We're going to see much higher gold prices. And Jim Sinclair, you know, the gold, the, 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 the gold guru was was, you know, saying we're going to see 2,000, 2,500, 3,000. What happened? The exact opposite. And that was the that was the demarcation line. In the beginning of 2013, gold and silver just just started started to really fall, and stocks, bonds, and real estate were the go-to places and continue to be. Now, the reason why gold isn't going anywhere or silver, now, it is manipulated, but the reason why gold and silver aren't going anywhere is because they're the barometer against fiat currencies, the debt, and the whole system. So when you keep them kind of under, under uh, out of the eyes of the public, then the public stays focused on stocks, bonds, and real estate. And so, but what's interesting, look at Russia. Russia's added a million ounces of gold to their official reserves in January, 300,000 ounces of gold in February, 800,000 in March, 200,000 in April, and 700,000 in, in, in May. So they've added seven, 93 tons of gold to their official reserves in the first five months of the year. What, is the US, has, what has the U.S. done? They've exported it all. They've <laughs> We have exported all of our gold, not only all of what we mined, everything of what we imported. We, we export it all because our system isn't based upon a physical backed kind of asset. Our, our economy is, I call it the leech and spend economy. And we, we absorb, we absorb energy and goods and services from the world because we have the printing press. So, even though uh, Kenneth gold has not or silver has not increased, 
I think what we're going to see, what happened in the cryptocurrency market starting in March, the same thing is going to happen to the, uh, uh, in, to the gold and silver. It's going to happen basically overnight. And I listened to a, 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 an interview with uh, uh, Harry Markopoulos on King World News. He's the guy that took down Bernie Madoff, which was a $65 billion Ponzi scheme. He said to Eric King in the interview that the U.S. economy, the U.S. market government is a, is a Ponzi scheme. And he sees the two big nails that, that could take the system down. They will likely take the system down are China and the insurance industry. And the insurance industry is, is international and it's not really regulated. And so if we think the pension plans in the U.S. are greatly underfunded because they need high they need a seven, eight percent, you know, a yield every year. The insurance industry is is in the same boat, and so we're we're looking in the future uh, at some point in time. And right now, the sentiment is down. And I'll, I'll conclude about gold and silver about this. I spoke with the precious metal dealer that I have on my website, and he he had a conference call with Asia. Asia continues to buy a lot of gold and silver. The Asian markets, the East. Continue as well as Russia is adding more gold. Matter of fact, their spot premium is higher for a hundred ounce silver bar in Asia than it is here by almost double. The West, for some reason, ever since Trump became president, the West has been denuded from the neck up. They they no longer are buying uh, precious metal sentiment is in the toilet. They're not stocking up on bulk food. They're not buying as many guns or ammo. They think everything is fine now, which is a it's a, an illusion. So I think going forward, this is like the this is like the calm before the storm, where we we become very complacent, even the precious metal investors. However, all of a sudden, one day things are going to change, and unfortunately, people are trying to time this market. They're going to sell. Oh, I'll sell my stocks, and I'll get into I'll get into gold and silver. Well, uh, by the time Bitcoin and and Ethereum and these other cryptocurrencies. They were going up so much people couldn't believe it. And then by the time you could believe it, they were up three, four, ten times the value. And then people are going to say, well, it's too expensive to buy gold and silver now. So this is what's going to happen when it comes to the precious metals. And we can we can discuss why now about the energy if you'd like to. Absolutely. Uh, I feel like the market has conditioned people to think that 1350 is going to be the high in gold and 1200 is the low so i'm not going to buy what above 1350 and i'm going to purchase my my gold uh, at 1200 but there's going to be a time when it, it, it creeps higher and uh, maybe people won't start paying attention to it until it's 14 15 1600 dollars and then they'll say oh well, i'll buy it when it when it goes back to 1300 and then sure enough it, it keeps going higher and that's what that's how so many people miss the boat on cryptocurrencies because they said it was high at 700 high at 800 high at a thousand 1500 i'll buy it back at a thousand and sure enough it, it bitcoin went to uh 3000 and left so many people you know at the train station and and i don't want that to happen to people with gold and we have a, a recent example of how this can happen and what what we were all feeling as as bitcoin was running so let's talk about gold here and and tie it into oil and gas one of your recent uh articles that you wrote was warning the global oil and gas industry is cannibalizing itself to stay alive. Let's touch on the industry and how it ties into precious metals. You know, uh, Kenneth, our, our system, our markets and economy is so complex now. People, uh, especially the young, the young kids in generation, you know, they have no idea that energy it drives everything. They just turn on their phone, their Apple phone, the TV, they open the refrigerator. You know, I mean, everything is you just, you, you take it for granted now. And we have because the energy has been plentiful for so long. But we're, we're, the, the oil, the global oil and gas industry is in big trouble. And 
I may have mentioned this before, but it's always good to uh, to um, to repeat it. Uh, last year, the the uh, the world consumed 25 billion barrels of conventional oil. Now, conventional oil is the highly profitable, and it's the, also the low cost oil. So we we consumed 25 billion. Unfortunately, we only discovered 2.4 billion. So we only replaced less than 10 percent of what we burned. Now, what's even worse than that? Over the last 15 years, the world has averaged about discovering nine new bi- billion barrels of oil every year. Well, we're consuming 25, so we're only finding a little more than a third of what we're consuming for the last 15 years. So we're living on past discoveries. Now, this is catching up to us because the um, EIA, which is the U.S. Energy Administration, uh, they just came out with a chart showing the first time that the uh, 68 publicly traded energy companies have seen their their liquid reserves fall in 2014 there were like 115 billion barrels their reserve in the last 2 years they have fallen to uh, right below 100 billion barrels now they've been adding them every year but now they've fallen 14 15% in the past 2 years and the reason why the reserves have fallen off because they're not economic uh, uh, like for example, uh, BP wrote off 3.5 or 3.8 billion barrels of its Canadian oil sands because Canadian oil sands is not profitable at 50, it's not profitable at 60, it's not, it's not even profitable at 75. So they just wrote it off, and we're going to see more of that going forward. Now, the bad thing, Shale oil and gas hasn't been profitable, and I've been saying that all with interviews with you for the last couple of years now. And what did they do to allow that to function? They they increased their debt. Now there's a there's a great chart I have on my website called the debt wall, and it's basically the amount of bonds below investment grade that the energy companies have to pay up pay off in the next several years. Well, in 2016, Kenneth, it was 27 billion. This year it jumps to 65 billion, and 2018 it's 100, it's 110 billion, and then it really jumps up to 230 billion in 2020, and then 265 billion in 2022. Steve, let me well, jump in right there. So, wh- just to just to highlight, why is it significant that these bonds are below investment grade? Well, they, they, they would say some of them will be junk status. Uh, uh, what happened is the, the, the yields, because the interest rates fell, the, the central banks lowered interest rates. So you couldn't, uh, companies, investment companies, funds, mutual funds, pension plans, they couldn't find a decent place to make a yield. So the, the energy companies, the shell companies, were more than happy to give a higher interest rate and take their money. And a lot of pension plans, and I've heard insurance companies have been investing into the wonders of shale oil and gas production. Well, they haven't made any money. Well, so how do you do that? Well, you have to rip somebody off. Well, you, you call it a bond. And it's a risky bond because it's a, it's a higher risk bond. So it's, and now, be, because the, the, the debt now on the balance sheets of these companies is so much high, is so high, that the the likelihood of them making the money to pay back their just to pay back their debt, they don't even have the reserves to pay back their debt. So it becomes a risky or a, a below investment grade bond. And so what we have here is we have an exploding amount of debt that's due to, uh, from these energy companies, and that's how they've been able to produce the shale. It wasn't really profitable, but they found a bag holder. And they found it in in the market. And now, which it's even worse than that. And let me tell you this: the EIA has put together some great charts. And one of the charts that's in that article shows the debt service. Now, the debt service is your interest payment. Let's say you you're a poor American, and you're you, you've got debt up to your neck, up to your eyeballs, and you've got a credit card uh, outstanding. Uh, of ten thousand, that's your limit. Well, and you can't even make the monthly payment. You can't. You can't even pay down the payment. But what you have to pay is your minimum interest payment. Who knows what it is? Could be a hundred bucks. 
could be $200, whatever it is, you have to pay the interest payment. Well, the energy industry in the United States, up until 2014, was paying 25% of its operating cash to pay for its interest expense. This doesn't even mean paying down its debt. It's just you're, they're paying their monthly interest payment to service all that debt. Well, and since 2015, the last time they did this analysis was the third quarter of 2016. The U.S. energy industry is now paying 75% of their operating cash just to service their debt. That, that's like paying, taking 75% of your paycheck just to pay your credit card payment. That's how bad it's becoming in the U.S. energy industry. So now the problem was, and I'll give you an example of one typical, here's one example, Continental Resources, they are the big player in the back end. They have been one of the larger back end oil producers in North Dakota. Well, in 2007, Kenneth, Continental Resources was paying $13 million a year in their interest expense. That's not that bad. Well, not bad at all. Last year, they paid $321 million just to service their interest. And the reason why, because in 2007, the only debt that Continental had was $165 million. They now have $6.5 billion. Mm. Well, that debt became, that they, they increased their debt because they were spending more on capital than they were making from their operating cash. So now they have to pay a lot more interest payment. $321 million is a third of a billion they got to fork out every year just to pay their interest expense. Now, this is what's taking place now in the entire energy industry. This is not sustainable. So when this starts to really fall apart, Kenneth, the energy that runs the entire market, the entire system, starts to collapse. And when that collapses, as I've said before many times, it's going to bring down the value of stocks, bonds, and real estate so fast it's going to make people's heads spin. And then probably cryptocurrencies, especially gold and silver, are going to be the, the assets that are going to – one will flow out and into. And we have to remember there's like, uh, there's like $300 trillion dollars worth of global assets in the world, over $300 trillion. And there's only $3.1 trillion in gold and silver, investment gold and silver. We don't need uh, 50% of that money. We need a trillion or two. That's it. Maybe a half a percent, maybe 1% of smart people getting out before things really get bad, moving into the gold and silver market. And that will make, you will see the crazy prices crazy prices on just a 1% flow out of stocks, bonds, real estate into gold and silver. Just the 1%. If it's higher than 1%, we're going to see seriously ridiculous you know, numbers. So I wanted to end with that because the energy runs everything and the energy is in big trouble. So if you're in stocks, most stocks, bonds, and real estate, I'm sorry to say, you are in big trouble. Steve, one of the things you mentioned, and I've heard this before, just a fraction of the total assets flowing into gold and silver will send gold and silver skyrocketing, precious metals. And I guess the question is, is will a trillion dollars be enough to offset the manipulation? It it's makes sense in a true free market, but add in central bank and jp morgan and uh, you have a situation where maybe you need more than that any thoughts on that well uh i guess we this falling the falling oil prices has really gutted the industry and and, and back in 2000 they weren't cutting see they, they've cut capital expenditures oh my god they're cutting it's amazing how much they're cutting 50, 50, 50, 60 percent. When you cut capital expenditures, then you can't discover more oil. So they started doing that in 2013. And the reason why they did that is they realized they need $120 oil to bring on the new, new oil, the more expensive oil. They weren't getting it. They were getting 100, 110. So they start cutting. Well, when the oil price really started to fall and it hit, 20 something dollars a barrel in the beginning of 2016 it, it, it really gutted the industry 
and this, it's and now they're cannibalizing themselves just to stay alive. It, it doesn't matter in time. Uh, again, I'm not saying things are going to fall apart this week, next week, or this year. But we're, it's been eight. It's been nine years. Nine years since the 2008. So it's gone by pretty quick. Well, I think things are going to be very drastically different in the next several years. So the problem is they they can print money, but they can't produce barrels of oil. And the the thing is, uh, they can prop up the energy markets. The problem is the the energy the debt. People here, here's what's important. The debt is being used to offset this falling energy return on investment. And so you need more debt because you see the available surplus oil net energy in the market is falling so much now. It costs so much to produce the oil and deliver it to the market. There's not much net energy for the market to drive GDP. So the interest rate has to fall. And what's happening now is uh, we're using money printing just to, to produce GDP. And that, that can't happen much longer. And so the, the central banks are able to offset things, but they're just making, they're making the volatility in the markets much more leveraged. And, and so the best way to describe this, they will continue to try to manipulate the markets. They will do that. But at some point in time, they, they're throwing everything now. And it, it, this is a famous, uh, Jim Rickard said this. In 1998, we had the collapse of long-term capital management. Almost took down the system. Many people didn't realize it. Well, the commercial banks came and rescued long-term capital management. Well, what happened in 2008? The commercial banks, well, the, the investment banking industry, Lehman Brothers, totally went belly up. They disappeared. Lehman Brothers has been around since the Civil War. They're gone investment banking industry. Now we have still have the commercial banking industry. Well, the central banks bailed out the commercial banking industry in 2008 and continue to do so. So now that the central banks are buying assets, what? who's going to bail out the central banking industry? Uh, the, the central banks. Yeah, World anybody. Bank, I don't know. Uh, the World Bank could for a while, but I think Kenneth, the in conclusion... Bank. Uh, they are going to continue to try to manipulate this, offset this, but as we've talked about all the indicators, the leverage, the energy industry, so many things are much worse shape than they were in 2008, and it's all based on the energy, and that's the one thing the central banks cannot do. They can't produce profitable energy. Mm -hmm. And that really ties into even what you were talking about with Bitcoin, the energy that it takes to produce a Bitcoin. Uh, if if the price of that goes below that, it, it won't be economical, which, um, and again, ties into the value of precious metals, the value of energy, and, and the stability of the system that is being held together by the cost of production the cost to do things and everything's so so rigged right now and uh there's going to be a rejigging of the system i know that and we all know that we're all anticipating it so steve i want to thank you so much for coming on the line with me today sharing your thoughts your research with us in the way that you always do so if people want to learn more about what you're doing please let them know where they can go and find you Thanks, Kenneth. Uh, we had a great discussion. Uh, the uh, my website is the SRS Rocco Report, R O C C O Report dot com. I put out two to three articles a week normally on metals, the mining industry, energy, and now I'm going to be writing a little bit more about the cryptocurrencies. Not that I agree with it, but I do feel that the cryptocurrency market will likely will likely see a lot more funds move into them. Uh, I think the high was 110, 112 billion market cap for the total cryptocurrency market. And bef I mean, before the craziness, it was like, I think 30 or 40 billion. And so now, what happens when 500 billion or trillion moves into that? If it does, it, you're just going to see crazy numbers. So, uh, 
I'm going to talk about that, but I, I do believe that the precious metals are still going to be the safe assets because if things fall apart, gold and silver are still known, still known in the world as uh, money and a store of value. Uh, you go to any jewelry store that's somewhat reputable, they, they're going to know your gold jewelry ring or whatever, or they're going to give you a, 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 a high price for it. Now you walk in there with a hundred dollar bill after the market's collapsed, they're going to look at you and laugh. So I, I think uh, that's the that that doesn't change. That dynamic doesn't change. The people still understand gold and silver, even though a lot of Americans have forgot about it.